Hello Booktube and welcome back to another, uh, this is a what, a Thursday Mega Stuff video? These are videos where I just sort of lump together a whole bunch of little ongoing melodramas that wouldn't really make a video of their own. And we'll start with babies. <laughs> I put out a call for pictures of Shakespeare and got pictures of dogs and cats instead, even a couple of rats. Uh, so I thought we'd look at those together, the batch today. And the first batch comes under the heading of the faces of betrayal. <laughs> because dogs typically don't like to have a B-A-T-H. They typically don't like that. They typically, I, I told the story about how my basset hound, Lucy, used to assume that I was going to drown her. That I was, that I had finally decided, after years of toting and bailing to every single minor whim that she had, I was finally going to kill her. That was, she was fighting for her life when she fought against me to have her B-A-T-H. Uh, my current dog, my little, my little schnauzer Frida, is not quite so bad about that. She's, she's resigned. But she's not fatalistic. She knows it's going to end. She knows it has to be done. And she's starting to like the feel of it. It is Turkish bath humid here today. Just unbelievable humidity here today. So there's no, we would all, we would both be absolutely miserable if, if we had a bath today. But uh, from what I can tell from the weather information, that is going to change rather sharply. That, that there's, the, there's going to be a, an autumnal feel to the air. Uh, Starting tomorrow, maybe. So we will see. She's going to have a bath this weekend, definitely. Uh, but these dogs are having a bath. They're 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 much bigger than she is. She is easy to bathe. Just plop her in the sink and, and get it over with. It's easy to do. Uh, these dogs are uh, bigger. They require a basin of their own, and they are mostly not happy. <laughs> they are mostly they are mostly not happy. Oh, Zuzu. Oh, boo boo boo. Look at that. They would rather that not be happening. <laughs> Uh, and then we have this beautiful dog. Look at that. That is not Shakespeare. That is a science fiction anthology, but look at that face. You don't mind if you're looking at that face. <laughs> uh, so that is your uh, your baby's update. I don't have any mail. I, I, there's been no mail and uh, no deliveries of any kind and also no sight of my mailman, my new mailman. Uh, but I do have a tech update. I've been, I've been doing tech updates on this channel uh, because I have mentioned that I am investing a lot more time in e-reading. And that has made me think about e-readers more. I bought an Amazon Paperwhite earlier in the year because a lot of you swore by it, said it was a game changer of a decision. And I can understand why. It's very comfortable to read on and the battery simply never runs out. It's just it's sort of incredible. Uh, I really like my device. I could see using it, but not as a default reader because of one of its signature design features, which is that it is unconnected from anything else. One of the things that a lot of you praise the, the uh, Paperwhite for is that you can't get distracted by the internet uh, because it's mainly a dedicated e-ink reader. There is a way to, uh, to access a kind of crude browser through it, but it's many steps. It's meant to be cumbersome. I'm surprised they allow it to be possible at all. Uh, I guess there's no way to avoid it, since if it's, if it's got connectivity, you, there's going to be a way. Not sure if you can even hear me. Uh, so one way or another, that, that li turned out to be a limitation. I like it, but it turned out to, to be a limitation. That made me think, okay, well, no matter what, then you need a fully functional reading tablet. A tablet of some kind. Now, I already had a couple of those. I have iPads. Uh, and it turns out, I, I had originally retired a couple of those, but it turns out all the iPads that I have are able to read, to receive and read ebooks. All of them are. The oldest, the original iPad, can't do anything else, virtually anything else. It can hardly surf the web. My iPad 2, my trusty iPad that's 10 years old, turns out to be immensely capable. It's, it's old, it's a little slower, it's a little heavier, but with a little bit of file cleaning and a little bit of finessing of... Uh, workaround apps, it's, I made a, a completely functional machine out of it and bought a case for it and everything. So it works just fine. Then I have uh, two iPad Airs. One that I got from one of you, I believe, and one that I got on eBay, plus a little iPad Mini. And I also got uh, a big Kindle Fire, 10-inch Kindle Fire tablet with uh, expandable memory. I got a memory card for it. And this is on top of the little tablets that I had. I had a little Barnes & Noble Nook. I had a little Barnes, uh, Amazon Kindle. So a lot of reading tablets, a lot of options. But, uh, and a lot of them I liked. I don't know how many things I've read on that old iPad. I don't have any idea. Uh, but I started encountering a limitation with those, which was memory. Uh, 
the the Kindle Fire, I, I put a huge memory a huge memory card in there, and it turns out once after a, a minor kerfuffle, it turns out that I can I can open anything that I download on that thing, and I don't have to worry about running out of space. But I wasn't sure that I didn't like the iPad system, the iPad ecosystem better. And most of my iPads are worthless as as repositories for files, movies, ebooks, videos of any kind like that because they have almost no storage space. Ironically enough, that old iPad, the 10-year-old iPad, has the most storage space. But it's it's old and creaky. There's a lot of stuff that won't download on it. It doesn't get updates anymore. It's not refreshed anymore. That that starts to bother me because you don't know if you have a device like that that's kind of old, kind of, you know, still worthy but struggling. You don't know if next year is going to be the year when some crucial thing doesn't work on it anymore. And then what do you do, especially if you need it? Uh, so it was thinking like that, enabling thinking like that, that made me think, okay, well, then what you need is a new iPad. But then a lot of you were emailing me, especially the tech heads, were emailing me and saying, well, no, maybe you should consider an Android tablet, the Samsung or, or the Surface, something like that, something that... Has Androids, of course, are more adaptable. They're more personable, personalizable. They have expandable memory. They aren't what I'm used to. And I, I pride myself on not being that kind of old coot. The kind of old coot who only likes what he's used to. Uh, so I've been researching the, the, uh, the major brand Android tablets. I'd already done the research for an iPad, for a new iPad. I, quick, I considered the iPad Pro and quickly ruled it out. Uh, and then an iPad Air of some kind quickly ruled those out and decided that when I order a new iPad, it will be the latest just ordinary iPad, the one with the home button. I think it's the seventh generation. That will be fine by me. I will order that. That is, of course, that has made headlines and a lot of uh, YouTube review videos for being relatively expensive in the neighborhood of $320, $330. But you significantly increase that price if you want more memory. And I do. I want a lot more memory. So... Uh, if, when I get what, the, the iPad that I will get, I think, will be a 7th generation iPad with a lot of memory. And what I will do with that is simply load everything that I can onto memory cards and whatnot and drives of some sort and then load everything onto that iPad. Because my goal is to have one machine to rule them all. One machine that I don't need anything else for. Uh, so that, but I have decided, I think, it's it's absolutely heretical, but I have decided to take the, the quintessentially American approach to this problem and just buy my way out of confusion. So I'm not confused by an iPad. I know exactly what I'm getting with an iPad. But I don't know anything about an Android tablet, so I think what I need to do is research, root around, find out which Android tablet I want, and try that as well. I think in the end it will be money well spent. Uh, but along those lines, I wanted to make two, I have two questions for you. Uh, first of all, I want to know, I want to hear from all of you, not just the tech heads, but all of you who might have Android tablets of any kind. What are they like? Especially if you've moved from the Apple ecosystem to the Android ecosystem. How bad a shift was that? How much can you do on your Android tablet? Do you like it? And also a question about uh, iPads as well. Just It's just generally a question about tablet use as opposed to a laptop or a phone or or something like that. The in, the in between things, these tablets that have become ubiquitous in our lives and yet no one really thinks about uh, their impact or their their zeitgeist, as it were. And I want to know about that. So if you feel like it, feel free to email me. I leave my email on every video or leave a comment down below telling me what role your tablet plays in your life. If you have an, an iPad, like I had, I had one person email me and say, never leaves their side. Uh, I'd love to hear stories like that. And, and just open the conversation to everybody. Do you have an Android tablet? And if so, do you like it? Or does it have drawbacks? Do you have an iPad? And if so, do you like it? Or does it have drawbacks? I want to hear all of that. So that's your, your uh, tech update. Uh, and the only other update, the only other update that I have is movie related. <laughs> because I have been, in the last 24 hours, I have lost count. I have been absolutely bombarded by people wanting to know what I think of the new Dune trailer. Danny Villeneuve, the director, is doing a Dune movie, allegedly the first of two, in which he adapts Frank Herbert's famous science fiction novel, Dune, widely considered one of the greatest science fiction novels of all time. That has been adapted. It was adapted once for the big screen before, in an absolutely wretched mishmash. 
And then it was adapted for the Sci-Fi Channel, and, and they, I think, did a really good job. Um, and now it's being adapted again for the big screen with a with a all-star cast. You have uh, uh, Poe Dameron from Star from Star Wars. You have Jason Momoa. You have uh, uh, I think uh, what what's the name? There's a young woman, a very talented young woman, Zendaya. She was in the Star, the Spider-Man movies. She's she's really good. She's better than the Spider-Man than the Spider-Man uh, franchise. She plays Chani in this in this new Dune movie. But uh, but the center, the star of the show is Timothy Chalamet. Uh, and now, if you've been watching this channel religiously, and I don't advise that, you will know that I don't have a high opinion of this kid. Uh, I think he's he's not quite the full-blown psychopathic lunatic that Hollywood will sometimes enable, prop up with tens of millions of dollars, and then just let loose on the world, like Ezra Miller. Ezra Miller is a time bomb. He is waiting to go off. He will not have a long movie career. He will instead end up dead, hopefully just himself, and not with lots of victims. And it won't be long. He's right on the edge. He's a psychopath who has been enabled by sycophants all around him, with no one uh, hitting the brakes at all. Timothy Chalamet isn't that bad, <laughs> obviously, but, but nevertheless... Uh, he has been told for the last five years that he's Jesus Christ, come back to Earth. Uh, and it shows, I think, in his acting. It shows in the only thing that anyone should care about when it comes to him, which is the thing that he puts on the screen. His acting is always done with a kind of Leonardo DiCaprio mugging for the camera. He's always got an eye on an Oscar nomination. Seems to me that way, anyway. That the, that in any scene where he is, where he is asked to emote... Uh, he did, he did a movie just recently uh, where he plays a drug-addicted young man, and it was unbearable. It was unbearable. These scenes were all through the movie, and I know it brings out the worst in young actors just in general. I mean, James Franco had a movie with Robert De Niro where he played a drug-addicted son, and his own, uh, you know, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille, long tortured scene a, there's always one long tortured scene where the floppy haired beautiful young man who's a drug addict in the movie emotes about his life there's always one in in beautiful boy there were like six in in i think it was by the sea or town by the sea or something like that james franco had one of those scenes and it was so bad it was so unbearable that de niro, de niro couldn't stand to be in the scene with him so the, he, franco's just emoting to the camera because De Niro said, no, I don't want to be part of this at all. I'd laugh. <laughs> so, uh, or punch him. Uh, Timothy Chalamet is that kind of thing. It doesn't have the honest simplicity of an old-style scenery chewer. Instead, it believes in its own profundity. And he is Paul Atreides. He is the star of the show. And uh, as much as I thought, well, you're bringing in heavyweights to, to deal with this, Oscar Isaacs, that's the name of Poe Dameron. He's actually quite talented. And there are a number of other quite talented people in this movie. Uh, and originally when I saw that, I thought, okay, well, if you're bringing in this kind of talent, then you must know that this is about the downfall of a family. Yes, Paul Atreides will become the Mahdi, he will become Muad'Dib, he will become the singular person in the galaxy. But for most of the action of the novel, Dune, that isn't true. And it shouldn't be true. So I thought, okay, maybe maybe uh, Danny Villeneuve, who is, who is a blithering idiot, at least knows that, or had somebody tell him that. Uh, but then I saw the trailer. <laughs> the trailer came out. A number of you have been asking me my opinions on it. And uh, my one of my foremost reactions to it was a bit of dialogue that is meant to be climactic at the end of the trailer where we hear a voiceover from Timothy Chalamet, who uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had a, a, a lover or a husband or a wife who, who talked in their sleep. Uh, where it'll be three o'clock in the morning, and suddenly you hear them say, "Yeah, no, you need to turn now. You see, no, this road doesn't have any right turns. You need to turn left. No, you need to turn left. You just need to do that. I really think you should listen to me." Okay, well, you turned left, and that worked out. That's what Timothy Chalamet sounds like when he reads the, the voiceover in this movie. It's a resolute, bored monotone. The bored monotone of a hair-flipping model rather than an actor who's taking his role seriously. And but anyway. You can't do a, a Dune trailer without reciting at least a bit from uh, from the famous lines from the first book. 
I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Uh, Dune fans will know large chunks of that by uh, by heart. <laughs> and I do. I know chunks of that by heart. Uh, and that little saying in Dune ends with the rest with the reciter saying that they will. The, the gist of it is that you will abstract yourself from your fear and watch as it passes. And where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Nothing will remain. Uh, the, the, where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Uh, and <laughs> the end of the trailer has Timothy Chalamet reciting bits and pieces of I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. And when he, then they break, it, it doesn't recite the whole thing, and when they break to him saying the line, only I will remain, and it's this loving camera just focused on his big Lollapalooza face, I suddenly had just a chill run up my spine, because that is not an ensemble piece at all. That, that, is, that is the director almost consciously signaling that this is a star vehicle for one person, for, for one glamour puss kid. Uh, it was it was chilling to see the camera center on Timothy Chalamet's. Uh, he has he has no pores in his skin because he's not entirely human. He's mostly a uh, studio constructed android. Uh, he has no pores in his skin. It looks like porcelain, and he has the the, the floppy hair and whatnot. And uh, when the camera centers in on him as the as the voiceover saying, "Only I will remain," <laughs> so it's like, "Ew!" <laughs> you do know that you have co-stars, right? <laughs> uh, there's always a problem with uh, cinematic adaptations of Dune, not in the sci-fi version, but in any kind of movie adaptation. There's always a problem with uh, Paul's mother. The Lady Jessica is a member of the, the uh, sect of futuristic super nuns called the Bene Gesserit, who are counselors to those in power. They are power brokers themselves. They have a massively complicated breeding program designed to bring about a messiah uh, in the human population. And they are masters of subtlety and nuance, a reading of body languages and a reading of others and uh, projecting that confidence, you know, to the, the men that they prop up and the women that they prop up. And directors seem to have, male directors seem to have a problem with that. They really do. Male directors seem to need to import visual iconography into this. Almost like they, in, in the original wretched Hollywood movie, they're bald. The Beanie Jesuit are bald. <laughs> they're bald this is a, this is a, a, a super society of, of highly advanced and intelligent women who share a hive kind of memory and one of whose main purpose is to provide concubines and wives for power brokers in order to move the levers of power within the Imperium that mission would be to put it mildly a little bit hampered if you were turning out bald acolytes <laughs> but nevertheless Lynch the director of that first movie had to to gin up some kind of visual iconography for the Beanie Gesserit. And same thing with Villeneuve. He has them uh, draped in mesh face cloths, which wouldn't work for a lot of the visual subtlety, a lot of the, the stuff that I just described. It wouldn't work. The Beanie Gesserit are obviously not cloaked figures. They obviously aren't. And I might point out here, th this director, as I mentioned, he's a blithering idiot, and he has made self-serving statements to the press about how he needed to do some gender swaps in, in Frank Herbert's novel because, really, women are a little underrepresented in the, in the novel. It's kind of hilarious if you know the novel. That's kind of funny. I mean, the Beanie Jesuit, and specifically Lady Jesuit, Jessica and Chani, are pretty central to the book. They aren't add-on characters. They would pass the Bechtel test. Uh, Villeneuve said, you know, I, I gender swapped, especially one key character, in a way that the gender swap would not work at all. You cannot gender swap Liet Kynes without doing serious damage to the whole book. He doesn't care because he's never read it, because he's a moron, because he pays attention to Twitter, because he doesn't want to be dragged by Twitter scolds as a fascist or a boot heel sexist or whatever. Uh, he's made those uh, squeaks of right think to the proper corners of the Twitter censor sphere. And yet, and yet, what can you say about a male director who needs to add a fetishistic visual element to indicate that a super society of advanced and intelligent women are somehow special? <laughs> what can you say about it, the fact that two directors separated by 40 years felt the need to do that? That is sexist. <laughs> Obviously, that's one thing you can say about it. What is Lynch or Villeneuve saying about the Beanie Gesserit? Well, they are remarkable, but how are you going to know that? 
If I don't tell you, if I don't show you visually how they're remarkable, how are you even going to know that? Who would even suspect it? You don't need to do that with any of the male characters. Certainly you don't do that with any of the male characters. There is absolutely no, the thought never crossed Phil in his mind to signal visually to his audience that Jason Momoa is a badass. That never crossed his mind. But when it comes to the Beanie Jesuit, I guess just from the trailer, it could it might the movie might not be true, but from the trailer it looks like the Beanie Jesuit wear a kind of mesh hood over their faces. I guess to signal how, that, hey, you better pay attention. These are weird. <laughs> these, these women can't, they can't be smart and accomplished and formidable just looking like women. No, I have, to, I have to add something here for you, something that will help you with that. Even though, let's keep in mind, in the world of Frank Herbert's novel, the lady Jessica could rather easily defeat Duncan Idaho, Jason Momoa's character, in physical combat. Rather easily. It wouldn't have been any trouble for her at all. The Lady Jessica could probably have defeated all of Duke Leto's extremely practiced masters at arms, Thufir Hawat, Gurney Halleck, Duncan Idaho, together, alone. She could probably have done that. Uh, it, but not in this movie. <laughs> in this movie, I'd be willing to bet that isn't true. We'll see. I could be wrong about that. I'm hoping that I am. After all, when when Lady Jessica and Paul are abandoned in the desert, when they are lost and down in the desert and their survival turns on a knife edge, it's largely Lady Jessica's ability in physical combat that saves their lives, that wins them a place with the Fremen. Now, the Fremen in the movie looked pretty good. Uh, the still suits don't look weird. The, all, all of the visual iconography there looks pretty good. Uh, so, I, I, don't, I don't have much more to say about the trailer. It gave me... It gave me pause in a lot of ways. I don't want this to be the, Tim the Timothy Chalamet show, and I get the strong impression that it's going to be. I mean, I'm not, I'm not unrealistic, right? I'm, I'm not saying, of course, any cinematic adaptation of Dune is going to put a lot of emphasis on the character of Paul Trades. He becomes rather central. Of course, to an extent, it's going to be a star turn. But again, I would, ar I would argue that the right way to do it is, for instance, Alec Newman's performance in the sci-fi channel of Dune. Alec Newman is a fairly talented young actor, but he is definitely part of a meshed ensemble in that movie, even when he's on his own. The, the, I forget the name of the actress who plays Lady Jessica in that movie, but she does a great, a great job. And she's replaced. in The, the Sci-Fi Channel also adapted uh, Children of Dune, and she's replaced there with the same actress who played the Borg Queen, and who also did a great job. Uh, but uh, one way or another, the only other... So I was I was worried about that about only I will remain. I was worried about that that the timing of that quote plus Timothy Chalamet's Lollapalooza face just gave me pause, and uh, I I'm off the top of my head not remembering who is cast to play Fade Rotha in Villeneuve's Dune. Of course, in the in the previous iteration of Dune, it was Sting. It was the the front man for the police. And he did an okay job, as, as okay a job as anybody could in that movie. I felt so sorry. In that original movie, I felt so sorry for Jose Ferrer. A, a truly great actor. A, a truly towering uh, talent. Who obviously didn't have any idea what was going on around him. What is this stuff? I mean, you're offering me a pile of money. So I'm going to say yes. But <laughs> what, what, is this, what is this dialogue that I'm saying? Why am I talking to a giant man-sized goldfish in a tank? Why is any of this happening? <laughs> uh, I felt sorry for him, but uh, Sting's performance in that original Dune has largely been lampooned uh, because it's it's so over the top. But I forget who is cast to play Fade Rotha in in this Dune. The Sci-Fi Channel version of Dune did a masterful job. Again, I forget the name of the kid who played Fade Rotha in that, but he does a great job. And the Sci-Fi version of Dune very cannily reminded its viewers that this story comes down not to a gigantic battle where nuclear weapons are blasting a hole in a gigantic rock wall and warriors are streaming through it mounted on giant sandworms. The story really comes down to a semi-naked knife fight between two young men. Though if Paul Atreides had lost that knife fight to Fade Rotha at the very end of the book, then everything would have been different. It wouldn't have mattered. It, none of that. None of the rest of it would have mattered. All of it would have fallen apart. It would have been probably a blip on the radar in the career of Emperor Shaddam. But so, and the Sci-Fi Channel does that wonderfully because it's full of special effects, 
But when it comes down, the, the special effects of the climax are terrific. Absolutely terrific. And there's force shield fights and all that sort of stuff. But the conclusion of that, of that show is just physical choreography. It's just, it's just a brutal, fast, vicious knife fight between two young men. And I'm wondering, of course I'm naturally wondering, if maybe the reason that I don't remember anyone talking about who plays Fade Rotha in this new movie is because Villeneuve is going to side to downplay him. I have no idea. Or, I, I mean, it could be that Villeneuve will decide to, to gender swap him. That would be catastrophic for the book, but I don't think he cares at all. I think he's thinking, you know, worms and the kid. <laughs> but but I, I don't know who that is, but I'll be interested in seeing. It's only a trailer, after all. We have to keep in mind, I've been naturally, since all of you were asking, I I couldn't help but notice that YouTube is absolutely flooded with uh, reaction videos to this trailer, usually composed of uh, older the old enough to know better fanboys literally tearing up when they when they watch it. I guess I guess it takes all types. I guess I guess there's all kinds of tastes, and my taste in movies may be may not be your taste in movies. But one my last comment about this Dune trailer uh, is that I'm I'm mystified by Villeneuve's decision to film this thing in black and white just mystified. I watched this trailer three or four times. It is uh, funereal in its solemnity. I think I, a couple of times I caught the faintest hint of a shading of color, but most of it is murky black and white. Now that just means, it might be that those scenes are just the only ones that were ready for the trailer, but Dune is a very bright book. It, it's, a, it's a hot, bright, sunlit planet. It's, it's, uh, it's colorful. It's a colorful, big, epic story. And the, the trailer is entirely in black and white. And murky black and white, at that. Now, some of you are going to say, no, it's not. It's just low resolution. What? No, it's, it's not black and white. You can see colors. If I can't see colors, if I have to study them, if I have to intellectually think, all right, well, intellectually, that's probably green, then there aren't any. And that worries me. <laughs> that really, really worries me. I had my fill of that uh, with the Zack Snyder Superman movie. The first Zack Snyder Superman movie. What was it called? Superman Returns or something like that. There's there's even a, a, a YouTube video mocking the idea of, of how low resolution, how somber the color palette was in that movie. There's a YouTube video where somebody says, what if Zack Snyder's Superman movie had been filmed in color? <laughs> and they redid it so that you can see it in color. And it's a world of difference. And that, that's, that is a problem. That is a problem when your director is also an auteur, when your director has somehow managed to bamboozle through sexual favors or piles of cocaine or whatever, somehow managed to bamboozle not only Hollywood, but the movie critic sphere into thinking that he is somehow more than just a director who gets a job, that he is an auteur. That is always a danger, that an auteur will get a hold of... You, an auteur can do Inceptions all day long, and I won't care at all. An auteur gets his hand on, on a, what we'll call source material that I deeply love, then I have a problem. <laughs> because that, inevitably, that auteur's direction, directorial version of that source material is going to become that source material. How many people came to Conan the Barbarian through the Schwarzenegger movie? And maybe you can't get rid of that. And maybe that's not good. <laughs> the... Well, in the Schwarzenegger Conan movie, it's definitely not good because he's a big, vengeful oaf when Conan is a lot more than that, even as a young man. Uh, so naturally, what I'm trying to say, this is going on way too long, what I'm trying to say to all of you who are asking, of course you wanted this kind of detail, I guess, was the Dune trailer filled me with foreboding. <laughs> okay? It filled me with foreboding. For those three main reasons. One, it looks from the trailer like a Timothy Chalamet star vehicle, and it absolutely shouldn't be. And two, <laughs> uh, I don't know why the Beanie Gesserit are wearing sacks over their heads. I think I do know why, actually. I, I don't know what, what reason is going to justify that internal in, in the internal reality of the movie. I think I do know why. It's the sexism of the director. Same as the sexism of the last guy that directed it. And had to do something with the Beanie Gesserit to show the audience that they aren't just, I don't know what, groupies? <laughs> I don't know what. It's very telling when you have to give a visual iconography to only the, the, this one group of characters who happen to be the most capable women in the story. That seems to me to be very telling. And not a coincidence, since it's now happened twice. And and third, that the, this, this adaptation of Dune is filmed in black and white. 
which is really weird to me and disturbing because it, it might betoken other liberties taken with the whole thing. So, uh, and again, I want to stress before I wrap up, I'll wrap up now, but I want to stress to any of you who might be mu movie purists out there. I know there's at least one who's watching might be a Villeneuve fan. Uh, and I want to stress also to, to those of you who are sci-fi fans who have seen the trailer, I want to stress that I am talking effectively in black and white. If, if I know I'm aware that the trailer is not literally in black and white. I'm talking effectively and I'm saying that if this is a trend, I reject it. It obviously is a trend in Hollywood and I reject it. <laughs> so if, it if the trailer wanted me to be in color, it would be in color and it isn't. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to wrap up for now. Good Lord. So that was a mega stump video uh, for Thursday. And now I don't have to answer the 150,000 emails that I got all asking me, what did you make of the Dune trailer? I don't have to answer those now because this is it. I'll, put, I'll be sure to put Dune trailer in the title of this video so that you know where to go. <laughs> so we will wait. All of this could be wrong. And I'm severely tempted to do another Dune read-along when the movie comes out. And I will, of course, be very interested in seeing... I'm not so much caring about... I, I don't have any faith in Villeneuve as a director. I think he's a moron. And makes very obvious, very stupid choices, usually. Uh, again, I don't want to ruffle the feathers of purists. No, for me... The, and also, I wouldn't be insane enough to see a movie in a movie theater. If I get an electronic screener of this thing, I have a friend who might be able to send me one of those. That's thing. That's fine. But I, you would have to be absolutely insane to go to a movie in a movie theater that had other people in it in 2020. <laughs> so it's not so much that. For me, the main interest is going to be ancillary. It's going to be what kind of Dune-related stuff does this mega-budget movie flush out of the publishing houses? Do we get new gift editions of Dune? New reprints in paperback, maybe, with the movie artwork? Do we get... Uh, new collected editions, stuff like that, new anthologies, all sorts of, our, our oldest stuff brought back into print, the Dune Encyclopedia, or A Man of Two Worlds, for the Frank Herbert books like that, are they brought back into print? That is mainly what I'm, what I'm looking at. Predictably enough, the bookish stuff is, is what I'm looking at, what will happen as a result of this movie, especially if it does well. Uh, so we will revisit this subject many, many times. But there you go. That is your Dune reaction. I hope you care about the rest of it. So I'm going to wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.